So the first question is just super broad. Just tell me about the history of of the boat, what you know. Uh, it was built in Canada. This is my fifth boat that I've had that's built in Canada. And it was built by Wall, which is actually Prince Rupert. Built in Prince. I've had four of his boats that, that he's built. And uh, I got it in um, 2000. I've had it since then. It was built in 75, 1975. And they had a buyback program. Um, I've got two different boats from their buyback program where they're trying to get the number of fishermen down so they'll buy. Uh, there in Canada, the, the license is on the boat, the fishing license. Where here in Alaska, it's the individual owns the license. So to eliminate fishermen, they had to buy the boats. Uh, but this last buyback, they just bought the right of it to fish, and the owner kept his boat, which seemed like a good deal, but then what do you do with all these boats that can't fish in Canada again? Mm -hmm. And so consequently, I think he paid seven over seventy thousand for the boat in he bought it in the eighties and he sold it to me for sixty two hundred dollars. You couldn't get a little skiff for that. Mm -hmm. So it was great for us. <laughs> uh, there's two or three saners here the same thing that they you, you got them for pennies on the dollar because of the buyback program. So Great. And was she a uh, a gill netter in Canada? No, it was a troller and crab boat. It was built, actually built to fish crab in Hecate Straits. And that's why it's so deep, draws seven feet of water. And a normal gill net is probably about three or four at the most. They're fairly shallow. So it's heavy on the gear, but the fishery has changed so much that that's not a factor anymore. It used to be the big item. You had to have a little boat and it had to be a double ender because you're hauling this net over the stern. And now we still do the same thing, except most of the boats are my size or some even bigger. Cool. And so um, so just to be, you know, I know a little bit about gill netting, right. but just to be really basic, will you tell us uh, what gill netting is uh, in general terms? It, it just, you, you have a net and it has corks on the top and web and then lead line, and it just hangs as a wall in the water. And you do all kinds of things with it, put, make it different shapes so you trap the fish in, in it. And now with the new web we have, uh, when I started, you had cotton web. And you couldn't catch anything in the daytime. It was like a cargo net. But now the new style webs we have, we fish all in the daytime and don't fish at night anymore. Or very, I, very few people I ever fish at night anymore. It just fish during the daylight hours. So it's just a wall of web that they get tangled in. They don't te technically get gilled, they just get wrapped up in the net. That's what they do, hit it, it kind of makes a pooch, and they turn or swirl or something and they're just bagged up in the net. So. Okay, and then you see, um, how long do you soak the net for? Uh, I do about 15 minutes, but I, I fish one little stretch of beach, and once I've moved that 100 feet, I pick up the net. Now most of the guys, it's, I would say it's an hour. Some are two hours, but most of them an hour. Okay. And but I'm, I, where I fish is different, and how I fish is different. Okay. So ninety percent of the boats. And do you fish differently because of the Voyager, or just what works best for you? Yeah, it, it's the area that I fish. Okay. It's real site specific, like two, not even two, maybe a hundred feet of beach that I fish. It, it's actually a point. I'm fishing this point. Once you get past the point, you're not going to catch much. So you pick back up, move back up on the point, drift off, move back on the point and stuff. And so you, your sets aren't uh, a lot of fish, but you make a lot of sets during the day. The average gillnetter probably makes 10 sets, and I make 20 or 25 sets in a day. And uh, so you're not getting many per set, but times 25 is good. And then in that 25 sets, you'll have two or three that you get a lot of fish. And so constantly at the end of the day, it's a, it's a good day. All right. Thank you. And, um, and so then we answered, um, who built the boat? We answered when she was built. Um, you answered, uh, if she does the job that she was built for and she was trolling and crabbing right. in Canada. And, um, and then 
And then you converted her to get right. on that, or was she already? No, I converted it over. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it, which was pretty straightforward. Before, like now, the reels on deck. Before Gilnutter had to have a cockpit, and the reels down in this little cockpit. And uh, but now we catch way more fish, and we're tanked down. In other words, the hold of the water, uh, your fish hold is full of water. So the boat's low. It's basically loaded when you don't have a fish aboard. And uh, because of the hold full of water. So when you had this cockpit, you'd have water in the cockpit all the time. So we went to our reels on deck and stuff. There's, there's as much change in the last 30 years in the boats as there is between the Wright brothers and a space shuttle. I mean, if you'd have had this boat 30 years ago, they would have laughed. I mean, it would just be, and now if you had one of those boats rigged that way, you know, they go, that guy's wasting his time. You know, <laughs> it's just unbelievable to change. Yeah, it's interesting because I was, um, you know, I was trying to track down wood boats in all of right. the gear classes and trying to find a gill netter that was older was difficult. You know, yeah. oh, this yeah. boat and then um, we also did the Audi and those are boats, you know, yeah. built in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I couldn't for the life of me find one local that was... Yeah, uh, older than that. So you have to if you have a wood boat. There's a fallacy that there are a lot of maintenance, but if you started out with a brand new wood boat built by a reputable builder, fiberglass, aluminum, or steel, and they all say had the same engines and same gear, there wouldn't be. And you want them to look nice. There wouldn't be five cents worth of difference in the maintenance cost for the first 25 years. And that's what the Canadians they build. There was hundreds of builders. This company that I uh, bought or uh, built this uh, at Digby Island in Prince Rupert. There was the dad and four brothers, and they'd built 1,300 fishing boats. But you would go down on a Friday if you ordered a gillnet boat from them. You'd go down on a Friday and you'd pay them a third down. The following Wednesday, you pay them another third. And the following Friday, you pay the last third and pick up your boat. Seven days. They just cranked it right out. Uh, it was just amazing that they get orders for 50 boats and the four of them would build that plus do all the other stuff too that they did. Uh, they had it down like a, a, um, a hit. There's a book out, um, Legacy in Wood. It's about that family and okay. all the bills and stuff uh, that they did. It was amazing. They had their own, they had their shipyard of course, but they had their own sawmill to cut wood and stuff for them. And this is the the Wall family? Wall family. Is and, it W-A-H-L? Or? Yeah, okay. W-A-H-L. And there was dad and four brothers. Each one had their own specialty of building the boat. Some were the framers. Some were the plankers. Uh, the youngest brother did all the mechanicals in the boat. And his dad allowed him 12 hours to do all the mechanical wiring, plumbing, engines everything but now they did the same boat over and over so it, you know you get it down but now if you had this boat built in a shipyard you would be i don't know if they could do it in one winter I yeah mean, it's just crazy what they did that's I'm amazing living. i've always kicked myself that i didn't go down they were were the uh, the same island the airport in rupert is mm. i always kicked myself that i didn't go down and just spend a day there and watch this because uh, the, uh it would just uh, bang, 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 bang. You know, unbelievable. But yeah, I can't imagine the speed at which. Yeah, been they just uh, and they uh, in Canada at that time they had uh, when they were building wood boats. Uh, there was probably a thousand boat builders in BC. It was kind of standard if you're a fisherman, kind of handy. You would build a boat in the winter time, fish it that summer, and sell it. Now, I'm sure it had something to do with their taxes or something, but. Um, and so there was a lot of boats, but the walls would always win the, the best boat of the year, best cat, uh, most beautiful boat of the year. They'd just win it over and over. They just had their boats were just, uh, and there was a lot of beautiful wood boats in Canada. They really specialized in that, but they would win over and over. Wow. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. So, um, so you touched on that you became the owner of her in 2000. 2000, yeah. Um, what was that journey like, uh, getting her? Well, I, I had another boat that was a freezer boat, and I was uh, 
um, salmon fishing in August and the main engine dropped the main bearing. So big, day. you got to change the engine. And so you got a choice. Let's do the airmail thing and get mechanics and do all this, trying to get out and get a little bit of the season left or just stop because that was in August and in October I start shrimping and just take your time and get ready for shrimping. Forget about the last of the salmon, which I did. Put a new main engine in, put new refrigeration in because I froze on board. I was processing and selling to EC Phillips. And um, first trip out, I hit in. I was up in Rudyard Bay and I hit, hit the rock wall, running full speed. I mean, I wasn't paying attention, which normally happens when you have a disaster on your boat. Somebody wasn't paying attention. We always like to blame it on there's a rock there that nobody knows about. Well, it's hard to, when you hit a 3,000 foot rock wall in broad daylight to say, oh, I didn't know, you know, but I was back aft watching the buoy line go over and it's real steep. So I'm 50 feet from the rock wall as I'm running down it and it turned and I didn't. And the boat just destroyed itself. And so consequently, I started looking for another boat. Had limited funds because, you you know, wood boat is insurance is almost impossible mm -hmm. uh, for it. So limited funds. You know, I just put a new engine in the other one. You know, you spend all your money getting ready to get the other boat ready to go. So I had a friend of mine, Prince Rupert, that just knew all the boats and everybody. So he says, get down here. We'll find a boat. I told him how much cash I had uh, to buy it. And there was several in Rupert that I could have gotten uh, for that amount that I had to spend. Yeah, but they weren't. I was looking for a, this is called a 40 foot wall. And I was, that's what I wanted. And it, it wasn't any. So I got back to Ketchikan on the ferry. And he had left a message at my son's house saying, I found you the boat, but it's over in Queen Charlotte's or Haida Gwaii now. I just got right back on the ferry, back to over there, took a look at the boat. And the guy said, Well, he wants 70,000 for it. And he had put a lot of work, new electronics and stuff. And it was worth it. It was certainly worth that. I didn't have the 70000 So I told him, well, I like the boat. This is exactly what I want. Um, he had sold the license off it, so he'd kept it for three years. There's nothing worse than a boat you're not using, you know. And I says, I, I'll give you 10 Canadian for it. And that was 6200 American. And he says, well, I can strip it out and sell the stuff cheaper than that, more than that. And I said, well, you can but that would be a crime to do that to the boat. And I guess that must have struck a note with him. And he says, bring the cash tomorrow morning and you got a boat. So that's how I ended up with a boat and then run it over here from Charlotte's. So. And she was named the Voyager? No, it was the um, something Ann. Okay. I can't remember what, what it was, something Ann. Okay. And he crab fished it and trolled it, tuna mm -hmm. trolled and salmon trolled it. And he was older and sold his permit out. And 90% uh, of the fish are caught by 10% of the boats. And so Canada got smart. If we got to cut the catch down, we really have to buy the good guys out. Mm -hmm. And so they paid this huge amount for the license, like three and 400000 if you were a gill netter. And you get to keep your boat. And so consequently, the old guys that kind of catch in the fish, they all sold out. So the program worked well, other than they had all these boats. They bought some people, bought them and made yachts out of them and, and stuff like that. That was pretty common. But uh, so that's how I ended up with the boat. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about this, but the next question on the list is um, what makes her unique? Well, it's a wall. It's wood. It's Canadian, which for a long time you couldn't fish a Canadian boat foreign built vessel, the Jones Act. Same with the cruise ships, mm -hmm. same idea. Yeah. You can't have a foreign built, but you can buy a Toyota car or a Sanyo TV, but you couldn't fish a Canadian fish boat. But I'd had five of them and I kind of learned the, first it was the customs that would add measure the boat. It couldn't be so big is what the deal was mm -hmm. in the Jones Act. If it was under certain size, you could do it, but that was a tiny boat, five ton net. And so the customs had it. They didn't understand the ad measurement of boats. Then they turned it over to the Coast Guard, which is even worse. They certainly didn't understand, but finally turned it over to American Bureau of Shipping and Bureau of Northvitus, which measures all the big 
all the freighters and everything, regular big commercial boats. And so you just had to learn those rules. And suddenly it opened up to where you get a big boat. Uh, I helped bring an 89-foot boat across. And it was, so it had to be under this five net ton, but it's really a meaningless figure. Mm -hmm. Because you get all these deductions. They, they cube the boat out. If you displaced it and shoved it down the water right to the deck, it would displace so many tons of water. Then you get to deduct the galley out and the pilot house out and the forecastle out and part of the engine room and part. Pretty soon sure you got nothing left. And you got eighty nine foot boat. It's five ton under five ton. So. Um, and then as part of that question, is there something when I'm photographing that you you'd say please don't miss this? Is there something that? Um... It's probably hard to do here at the float, but wall boats had a lot of flare to the bow, mm -hmm. a huge flare to the bow, which you don't see. Uh, some of the builders exaggerated it, and it kind of become exaggerated. Uh, but wall, just the, the guys had, and each brother, one would kind of t build a boat, and then the other one, would build, they'd all work together, but it, one would, and so they all looked different, but you could tell a wall immediately. It was just like a Chevrolet. There's all different models, but you can tell that it's a Chevy. Um, so uh, that's what I would say is unique to it is the flare in the bow, the shear to it. Uh, it's just, it's just, uh, they just had the eye for the, what makes a smooth line in the water. Excellent. Well, I'll try my best to um, to get that here on the dock. And I, if you're leaving relatively soon, you know, if it if it works out, just right. send me a. A message or give me a call in a time frame and maybe I can yeah, catch her I, as she's yeah, heading out. Yeah, I could yeah. do that. Yeah. Uh, I may have a picture of it too because I've taken a couple, three pictures just to emphasize that. Yeah. I might have, I'll have to dig through what few pictures I do Excellent. have. Excellent. And I will give you um, Haley's uh, information yeah, to send that okay. on to. Yeah. She's the, um, the main person I'm working the, with. Each one of the builders were just distinctive. You'd think it's a wood boat, it's this long, they're all the same, they're about the same width. You'd think they'd all be the same, and they're completely different. Each builder had, you could just almost tell there was Sather's, and Taguchi was a Japanese builder, and they were just so distinctive. You could just spot one a mile away. Oh, that's that's really cool. I'd love to to get that eye for, for right, the boats and know right. who's who. Like the, the Saners that are over here, the big aluminum ones, uh, the one is the Canadian boat, and that was built by... Um, Shorber Walter, shore boats in Vancouver, and you can just tell his boat immediately. Is that the Crystal? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Crystal yeah. Bay? Is yes. That, yeah. Ross Nagamini's boat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. At that time, there was two boats. I could have got a dozen fiberglass boats. I just didn't want one. Mm -hmm. And, or aluminum. And it was at that time, uh, one of the big financial companies that financed boats had taken back a huge amount of boats, and they had them in Rupert, and they basically just go down and pick out a boat and make us a cash offer, you know, so like 3000 Well, they had two boats just like the Crystal Bay that sold for $4,000. One was four years old. It would cost you a million dollars to build it today or more, you know, but they would just, it was, they sold it for scrap, you know. It yeah. was, it was really... Uh, if a guy had a million dollars back then, you'd be a multi-millionaire today because you could have bought them all up, you know, because they had some really nice boats. Yeah, that's, um, I think I was in my early 20s when my dad told me that we should, I should go get a Canadian boat. And I yeah. Was, oh, you know, yeah. that and seems it, complicated. And there's, <laughs> I some, done it. <laughs> there's so many false stories about, well, you can't get it and you can't fish it and you got to put false bulkheads in it and all is... I've done this and helped, I don't know how many guys bring boats across. There's seine boats over here. Uh, the, bo the one biggest one was 89 feet. It packed 180,000 pounds, but it was 1.1 ton. You almost couldn't make it to registry any smaller. Yeah. And perfectly legal, not gray area or nothing like that. It's uh, uh, the big shipping companies have set that ad measurement system up to, <laughs> to, to meet their <laughs> needs. <laughs> So it's it's a pretty simple thing. They they knew what they were doing there. Yeah. Right. Um so I know you you met the previous owner when you purchased her. Have has did they or has anyone else shared stories with you about uh this this boat? 
not not this boat here. I uh, continually, it needed some work when I bought it, of course, like any 25 year old wood boat, but um, I've taken pictures of all the stuff I've done, sent it to him, and Barry Marks, he lives in, in uh, Massett in Queen Charlotte City, and I, he's pretty old now, I suppose he's in his late 80s, but I put it on the grid and do something and send him a picture of it and stuff like that. Well, that's <clears throat> that's wonderful that he can see yeah, her continuing yeah, to yeah. work and because so many of the wood boats somebody buys them and they don't have the skill or the, the time or whatever to keep it up and it just goes downhill mm -hmm. and once they get to a point they go fast there's both right across the float there that barely floats mm -hmm. i mean it had water over the engine just two days ago so you know and it's just beyond fixing at this point mm -hmm. and stuff yeah um, so was, uh, it was Barry Marks? Barry Marks, And yeah. was he, did he buy her new, or was he? No, he bought it from another fella oh. in, in Massett. Well, actually, the other fella lived in Queen Charlotte City. He had it built new. Uh, Mr. Christensen was his name. And he had it built brand new. Okay, so you're just the third? Third owner. Third owner, okay. Yeah, excellent. Um, and you spoke about how the fishing industry has changed in your lifetime. Right. Um, do you have anything else you would add to to that idea? It well, Alaska is just so fortunate. I mean, it's beyond. Um, we have our board of fishing game that ma manages the fishery, and that's just people like you and I that get appointed to the board. And of course, each gear group wants to appoint their type of gear group to that board. But it seems like no matter who gets on the board. 99% of the time, the guy takes his gear group hat off and puts the what's best for the fishery hat on. And so the system works really well, uh, the regulatory system. Uh, it, uh, it just works. If you need a change done, you can actually make changes. I've probably changed, particularly in the shrimp fishery, 30, 40 different regulations as it evolved. Because uh, I was in the shrimp fishery way back in the 70s when there was only two of us fishing. but uh, And then we have uh, limited entry, which the, we owe to the people of the state of Alaska because they had to change the Constitution, saying that this is a common property that belongs to everybody, and but now it belongs to the commercial fishermen, in a sense, and is costly to get in. And... Had we not had that, I was on, helped set that program up, and I was, the only reason they had me there, that's all I did was fish, and the way it looked to me like, boy, if you didn't have a fancy boat and all this stuff, you weren't going to get a permit, and so I worked real hard that the dollar value was important, is how many years you fished and what you did, and that type of thing, and um, so limited entry passed, that the state voted overwhelmingly to change the Constitution, which I didn't think would happen. Uh, we hired a uh, consultant. I think we gave him a quarter of a million bucks. And he says, I'll win the election, but I don't want you guys to do anything. I said, well, geez, let's get on the radio and put letters in the paper of why we need limit. He says, don't do anything. So it was so negative against limited entry or changing this Constitution that at that time, the wife and I, we just went south. I didn't even vote. I said, and that's all he said, just you guys vote and get your wives to vote. That's all I'm going to ask you to do. Don't do anything else. We went south, and I called up the next day to see how bad we lost, and we had, I think it took a three-quarters vote, and it was over that. And so I called him. His name was Phil Jackson, and I called him, and I said, what happened? He says, well, we had the fishermen vote. They knew why we needed it, and their wives, of course. But I wanted every other wife in town that her husband wanted to go fishing, and she knew we're better off to stay working at the pulp mill or something, you know, which is nothing wrong with that. And so she voted for limited entry, and that's why it passed. And it, the fishermen then have a permit, and we, you know, you basically have control. So you had board of fisheries that you got, you could do good regulation and end up with good regulation. We had limited entry that put a ceiling on each type of deal, but the fishermen owned the permit. Um, and then the state legislature passed the law, mom and pop hatchery law, which for Sarah, Northern Sarah, Prince William Sound, uh, allowed us to raise hatchery fish 
and so consequently you, you got great regulation, you got a limited number of participants, uh, with that the permits are valuable, so it's kind of like a retirement in some respects, and you got the hatcher producing a block of fish every year that you could fish seven days a week on in these hatchery areas. So if they want to close the outside area for the natural runs, you really don't care. In fact, it's opposite now. We used to be pounding on the desk, give us some time to fish. And now if you go up and talk with fish and game, um, they will say, we probably get calls saying, don't give us so much time. Make sure you get escapement. It's completely different. Mm -hmm. So those three things, we have management that's just world class. I mean, absolutely world class. And when was uh, when did that vote happen? <sighs> it had to be in the early seventies. You know, um, the state, the federal government really pushed limited entry because they knew if any play, every fishery in every state was the same as us. Too many guys fishing, and how do you limit them? Well, Alaska, there's not many people, and it's a real fishing state biggest industry in the state and so biggest employment industry in the state so they really put a lot of emphasis so we they sent us around all over to every I think I went to every goofy village there was in to find out what should the law say you know because every place is different and the lawyers one village they might say well only boats that are blue can get a permit you know and that we'd go back that night to the hotel and these lawyers would say well I could beat that in a minute it's against the Constitution and they basically drummed into our head you can't give Laskins preference and so it ended up there's a town Pittsburgh California and Mount Vernon Washington you actually got more points than any Alaskan did and so it's went to this um, Supreme Court three times and no changes it's been upheld 100% all the way. But it was really tough on the guys that were drafted into the military, did their service, and it was a critical three or four years, and they got and they fished every year prior to that. Got nothing. And they actually had to go buy a permit. I know several of my friends that did that. But there was just no, except once they said, once you make that first exception, then there'll be millions of exceptions. And so, and it's set up that it's, um, it's probably the only real thing that's worth money that the IRS can't take. Mm -hmm. And they've tried right off the bat. Guys would owe money and they would seize the permit and uh, the state would call the guy and say, well, do you want to give your permit up? And no, that's what I do. Well, then we're not transferring it. And so you don't see that anymore. It, it was, uh, it ended up to be a, probably a very unique piece of, property that's got value well thank you i you know i've worked for fishing game in the past right. and i i know pieces of that but i've never heard it in that um in that story right. from your perspective right. and i really appreciate yes, that yes, we that's were right. we we're just so you can't you can't imagine when i started fishing in the early 60s canada was the god if we could just have a system like bc has BC's last year's complete salmon catch was sent in three containers to catch can to get canned. They have nothing left. You know, it's it just, it's pitiful because they had huge runs of fish and they just beat them down. The fish always lose. No matter what, the fish always lose. And with our management system, we can change easily and not a lot of politics our limited entry that limits the number of the guys in our history system that can put out fish to where we can still fish, yet we can leave the natural runs alone if we need to. And between those three, you can't lose. That's, that's excellent. It gives me pride in our state. That's The only bad thing about the whole system <laughs> is the price. We're not getting any more today than we got in the early 60s. It's, it's you know... I won't say more about the price, but <laughs> we don't have any competition either. And you used to have cash buyers and that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know. And in the same respect, if a processor loses millions of dollars and they bought 200,000 pounds of gillnet fish from me, they don't call me up in December and say, geez, we lost 50,000 on the fish we bought from you. Can you send us 10? You know what I mean? So they have to make almost obscene amounts from time to time. Uh, otherwise, 
you know, they won't be around. And that's why you're down. It's weeded out the ones that I guess aren't real um, business wise. Uh, and so we're down to two processors here or three, I guess, three. Yeah. So we, um, it's EC Phillips. EC Phillips. And then Trident. Is and, it Trident? Okay. And then uh, Alaska General Seafoods. Oh, AGS. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Now, see, AGS is owned. I don't know if it is today, but it, when it come here, it was owned by a fella in Canada. And in Canada, the permit went on the boat. Well, as the financial things went along, he ended up with all the permits. One person, I, at one time I heard he owned 47% of all the salmon permits because it was on the boat and the guy needs an engine. Well, okay, we'll just... Uh, uh, put a note on your permit or your license, you know, fishing license that's on the boat. And of course, as things get worse, you know, you more guys go broke and he ends up with these licenses mm -hmm. where Alaska is just completely different. Um, that was great. Uh, so do you have a favorite story about the boat or fishing that you'd like to pass on? Maybe the best day or maybe the worst day. Well, the worst day is when I lost one of my boats. <laughs> I mean, that's that's not a good day without. I've lost two different boats, and both I I don't carry insurance, so you you just get your checkbook out and write it in their check to buy another one. But um, I guess the best day is just all the days. I'm fortunate, you know, you're, I don't go to Hawaii and I don't drive a brand new pickup truck and, and all that kind of stuff. I've got a new house. I'm, I had, I've built three homes, no mortgages. I never had a pain of any kind. You get eight months a year off for your entire life. Now, even if you're not making a lot of money, that's pretty good. You can do anything you want for eight months a year. Now, you may not some years be able to afford to do anything <laughs> like last year, but... Uh, <laughs> It's just hard to, you know, if you got kids, you're there for eight months, every day, all day long, whatever you want to do, you know, uh, that's a plus that I think that what makes it even a bad day fishing a good day. Yeah, that's, that's great. And, you know, the next question, I think you've answered that too. It's fishing isn't an e easy lifestyle. Well, what keeps you going out? Well, I, I like the boats. I like the working on the boat to me that, that when, uh, it's not work to me, so I like doing that, and uh, I like working on nets and stuff like that. And where I fish, I normally fish, I don't see another boat, so you're kind of by yourself, which is odd for gill netting, because normally gill netting is a whole bunch of boats jammed up, and I, I call them boat fishermen. They're fishing boats and not fishing fish, you know. Um, uh, so it, it just, um, I don't know, it's just, it's just hard to be. Yeah. Hard to be. Now, you can almost do anything and make more money than you would gill netting in southeastern, you know. Uh, but there's just other pluses in there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we don't have to talk about where you fish exactly. Right. But um, there, there are just a few places you can gill net in southeast, right? right? It's like two right. districts. Well, there's there's actually about eight oh, okay. different districts. Oh, I guess I was thinking catch, lower. Yeah, yeah, here there's only one, Tree yeah. Point down there. Yeah. And uh, I fished that whole area, started at Foggy Bay, and I fished all the way down over. This would be my 59th straight year wow. of fishing. Um, I ended up now clear at the other end. I'm the last guy down there, as far as you can go. But you learn to get off by yourself, figure out what the fish are doing, not what the other boats are doing, and then just get the right gear. Uh, the nets are so important. Um, you might not wear the net out, but you always hang a brand new net every year. Never use it two years, and I've tried different. Well, I'll buy a heavier web. It'll last two years, but you don't catch as much fish with it. And so you get this, the finest twine you can get get away with and hang brand new every year. I used to switch when the nets weren't so expensive. I'd switch in the middle of the year and put a new net on. Use two nets in one year. But now they're so damn expensive that uh, you can't do that. And you want to um, have a new net because is it because of the visibility of the net? Right. There's two things you want to match is the watercolor. And 
you wouldn't think it'd be different, but from Mountain Point to Point Higgins, it's a different color. So you, the guy that fished, got a perfect net for Mountain Point. If he went to Point Higgins, probably won't catch much. So that's where these guys that switch all these areas and stuff, and they try to get the universal net. Well, there's what is a universal car? You know what I mean? There isn't one. And so you pick an area, and you get a perfect color for that area. Mine is different than most guys. Um, uh, the twine size has got, uh, I target hatchery fish mostly, so I can get my twine sizes different, and my mesh size is different than most of the boats. Although a lot of the guys have now switched to using the same mesh size as I do. Uh, but, uh, so it, it, it's real site specific. I mean, a, a mile makes the difference in the color of your net. That's very interesting. Yeah. So um, can you, can you, buy all the different nets here locally or how do you source uh the lines you could get here locally uh the corks and the lead line and the cork line and that you can uh, i use a pacific brand which is really hard to get of web nagura it takes me about eight months to get a piece of web um mostly there's a uh, wayne jackson that sells nets in town and he's got good nets and you know good gear but it don't fit where i'm at right and so that's another advantage. I have a boat coming. He, he comes down to fish where I'm at, and he doesn't. First off, you can shut the door on him. He don't, he don't know it. But he don't catch anything either because his net's the wrong color. And it's, yeah, just it, it just uh, all the little nuances, I guess. And that makes the difference at the end of the day. So when you say shut the door on him, is that, um, you know, we always talk about, even when we're trolling, we talk about corking somebody. Right. Is that that same idea where you're like... No, you, I've got it where it, it don't pay to cork somebody. <laughs> you just make them mad. And then they come and cork you. And then you got to cork them back. And then you go through this screaming and yelling match that you do and talking about each other's mother and that kind of stuff. Uh, give them plenty of room. But if you know the area really well, you can shut the fish off and still give him room. So that's, it's a more subtle. Um, it's a more subtle. You just close the door on him and he don't know it. Yeah. And as simple as that. And then they try to do set for set. I pick up, he picks up. I set, he sets. Well, he's not fishing fish. He's fishing me. So I go, well, after a few hours of that, I go, well, I'll just set my net backwards. And he sets his net backwards. You know, the... A lot of the gill nutters, the majority of the gill nutters, the vast majority, fish boats. Look for a bunch of boats, see what they're doing, how much room they give each other, and go do that. You know, it, it don't make any sense, you know. And then, or if they do try a new area, they will try the new area when there's no fish that they're catching. Well, there's times that there's, the fish just aren't to be caught for whatever reason. Uh, an old guy that when I started fishing, he's retired 25 years ago now, but we kind of fished together and I was fishing in the same spot and I'd see him leaving and I'd call him and I'd say, bud, I said, why are you leaving? God, I had 180 dogs this last set. Well, I want to go try this other spot. So he had this all as big itinerary of spots he could go to and he knew they were just as good as where he's at because he's been there when the fish are there. So he, you know, he, gets too crowded where he's at he knows another place to go by himself and the key to it is get off by yourself 90 percent of the tree point area has no boats in it whatsoever you can be if you look on the radar there's a big clump of boats here and a big clump of boats there um, and the rest of it's wide open some of the best spots when i first started aren't fished now and it's not that the spot is different it's just there's nobody fishing there so there's nobody to go over and fish beside. <laughs> it's crazy. It's really crazy. Yeah, so the the culture of it yeah, changes. It's a, yeah, you know, it just, uh, and then the expense of it. Now, I, I don't know, quite frankly, I mean, you're looking at half a million dollars probably to get into gill netting. Mm -hmm. And it, it's way too much. The, the state should never have started loaning money to buy boats. Now, loan money to buy a permit because you can't go to a bank and get money to buy a permit. You have to have the cash or a state loan. But they allow them to loan them money to buy a boat, and all that did was raise the price of boats. 
and which didn't help the fishermen in the end at all. You right. know, yeah, you can get the money, but you still still can't pay it off. You know. Yeah. And examples of this boat here, um, had there been a market for it in Canada, I couldn't have touched it for what I got. You know, the guy said seventy thousand. You might negotiate him down to sixty five thousand, but not to sixty two hundred dollars. You know, and right. and there just was no use for the boat. So, uh, the best best help they could do the fishermen. It's almost too late now. Is cut out that state loan program that loans money for boats. You know, it just uh, because they they get so overcapitalized that the fishery couldn't support it on a good year. And so I see this big turnover. I mean, I've seen three generations of turnover in the fleet. Yeah. You know, the guy will fish four or five years and, and then quit, or he'll get married. Now I have a couple of kids, and it just don't pay. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's, uh, um, I think now a new gillnet boat is five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars to go out and make. I think last year, the average was twenty-two thousand dollars gross. Gross. That's before anything. You know, if these guys hadn't got that COVID money, it did. I don't know what they'd have done last winter. Mm -hmm. That was a lifesaver for the fishery. Yeah, lifesaver. So. And the the COVID money was a, a government, a federal. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was a PPP. Okay. You know, uh, they finally allowed fishermen. They considered them employed. It's really weird how they consider fishing. Nobody considers a fisherman employed. Even that's all you've ever done your entire life, you're not counted in the state in unemployment or employment statistics. You're not even counted. They don't count commercial fishing. So they finally changed the PPP law, that personal paycheck protection or whatever it was, so we could qualify for that. So that helped the guys out. Very first time tariff, there was a big Chinese tariff put on salmon, Alaska salmon, and so they considered us like farmers so they said, okay, for every pound of fish you sold, you'll get 15 cents or 14, 16 cents tariff money. Uh, like a farmer that gets paid for his wheat, relief of the tariff. That was huge. That was huge. Um, and then well, there was one other program. Oh, the state has a program, disaster relief. I love it. 50 million for the fishermen. This is what, one and a half years after we started or getting close to it? No one has got anything yet. So I don't know what would happen if you had a real disaster. You know, well, call us in a year and a half, you know. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Now, the, uh, even like the Exxon Valdez money, what was that like? Oh, that was... 40 years or something? Yeah, ridiculous it was after? so long. Yeah, you're almost dead by then. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, it's just... Uh, and that's 90% of the fishermen's fault because we don't get involved politically. Uh, I was just talking with a guy today that fishes in Nacket Inlet, and we're going to use Nacket Inlet as cost recovery for the hatchery. Uh, he didn't even know it was closed for the summer. I'm going, that's the only place you fish. I mean, well, you've been in a bottle somewhere or a closet or something. You know what I mean? It just, um, uh, and that's our fault. You know, it really is. It really is. We're not active enough politically. Mm -hmm. We want, like, for instance, Ketchikan, the largest industry have is commercial fishing yet if you ask 90 percent of people on the street they say it's tourism and it's not even close mm -hmm. you know yeah i've always been um absolutely amazed by that you know i i grew up on a boat and i trolled off and on worked for fishing right. game and for me that's that's what i see and then i'll say you know that that troller that gill netter and you yeah. know people grew up yeah. here they have no idea what yeah. the difference is or yeah. in fact in the magazine our town i just sent one down to my brother I think they said there's 134 fishermen, loggers, and miners that live in Ketchikan. There's 600 and some commercial boats with stalls in Ketchikan. So I guess every logger, miner, and fisherman fish three boats at the same time. <laughs> well, so I asked the, the person who set that up, uh, Greg, and I says, well, where, where are you, you have to know that was a, a false number. Well, that's what we got from the state. Well, the state doesn't count commercial fishing as an occupation because we don't pay into um, unemployment per quarter. And so they, there's no unemployment, so they have no way of counting us. So they go, well, how many days do you fish a year? Well, I fish, say you fish 90 days. 
Well, that's in one quarter. So I guess you're unemployed the rest of the time, even though you're down every day working on the boat or hanging nets. You yeah. know, it's it's and I've dealt with and argued with. I guess the better way, the statistics branch, the state unemployment, to say, hey, we're the biggest industry with sixty six thousand licensed fishermen. Sixty six thousand. We're bigger than the oil industry, you know, as far as employment goes and the people that live here. And uh, so it's uh, it's really strange. It's the, the people look at fishing different than they do other occupations. Yeah, it's a hidden statistic. Here. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, one final question. And, you know, you've done such an excellent job of, you know, steering the interview. I really appreciate that. Um, but the question is, is there anything else that I should have asked? Well, I can't think of it other than if you were somebody thinking about getting into the fishery, mm -hmm. uh, the more skills you have, maintenance skills, so you don't have to hire things done. Um, all the boats I've had, I've never hired anybody to do anything. Engine work, electronics work. Um, you just got to learn that stuff. And then you got to have honesty with yourself that after three or four years and you're not making it, not everybody can be a fisherman. And I've seen guys hang on and hang on and I'm thinking, God, you know, you just, you know, it, it, it's, it's like singing. You can take all the lessons you want, but only a few can be rock stars. And, and it's the same thing with fishing. Not everybody can fish. I tried trolling, for instance. I am not a troller. I mean, a little eight-year-old could eat all the fish I could catch trolling. And that's when you could troll anywhere all the time. But I'm just not a troller. So it, so that would be uh, my recommendation. If you're thinking about getting into the fishery, get all those skills. to You can do the maintenance yourself. Um, don't get googly-eyed about you got to have a fiberglass boat or a fancy boat. Uh, go for that older one that you can work on that winter and, and get it. And it has to be enough of boat to where you're competitive, mechanically competitive out there. But that's pretty easy to do now. And uh, and then give it a shot. And if it works, it works. And if it don't, don't be afraid to say it didn't work and get out of it. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. All right. Well, gee, thank you so much. That okay. Was, that you was excellent.